I'm driving the other day, I'm listening to an interview on the radio, and uh, they were actually interviewing um, supermodel Giselle. I I'm sure you're all familiar with Giselle. She's Tom Brady's, no, Tom Brady is Giselle's husband, okay? Yeah. And they asked her one question. They said, Giselle, how did you get to be a supermodel, right? And like all of a sudden, yours perk up. Like, did she eat prop? Did she eat a certain thing? Did she, you know, did she work out a certain way? Ba 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 ba. And she said, quite frankly, I won the genetic lottery, which is absolutely true. She was born that way, right? She came out to be. She didn't come out six foot tall, but she came out <laughs> predetermined to be long-legged, long torso high cheekbones over six foot tall. So essentially she won the genetic lottery. This is what we're all trying to do here by breeding horses. Now on the flip flop, now she's a supermodel, all she has to do is be pretty graceful and, and, and walk the supermodel walk. I could do that for you right now, but I'd probably trip and you'd all laugh at me. But anyway, um, would you like to do it? <laughs> now on the flip flop from an athletic standpoint, I don't know if you remember, but uh, we're big on the Olympics. We follow the Olympics uh, religiously, and I think it was in Beijing was the Olympics that Michael Phelps won the record number of gold medals. And the interesting thing to me that stuck in my mind was NBC did this um, thing on, it was actually a diagram of Michael Phelps' body, why, he was actually predetermined and predisposed and genetically the swimmer that he was. And this is why. He was over six foot tall, but his wingspan was longer. His arms, when he put them out wide, were actually longer than he was tall. Big giant feet, big giant hands, very long torso, short legs, but giant thighs, right? Luckily, somebody pushed him in a pool. Because wouldn't it be a shame if you were built like that, built to swim and not fallen in a pool? So essentially, he was genetically predetermined and predisposed to be a superior, superior athlete. So luckily, I got this uh, section of the the talk where I have probably up here one of the most beautiful slides we've seen so far. <laughs> we have Secretariat, uh, probably the greatest racehorse that ever lived, um, a horse that we use as our model for perfection. Uh, in fact, some of the uh, measuring uh, companies and some of the people that do heart scans use Secretariat, use his measurements and his heart uh, size and his heart parameters as the standard by, by, by which we all measure, we're all trying to get to the perfect horse. And then on the right, we have mentioned some of the greatest horses that we, we've had uh, in the past 25, 30 years. Zenyatta, John Henry, Real Quiet, Curlin, and all the different things that you know, maybe detracted from their price in the, in the auction arena but actually they went on to be fabulous, absolutely fabulous racehorses. So there's, there's a little bit of a disconnect between what happens in the auction ring and what actually happens in the, in the, uh, on the racetrack. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just go through to page 28 because I'd like to start with the whole horse first and give you a little bit of an idea of what I look for um, when I'm looking at yearlings and really what you should be looking at or looking for when you are trying to, trying to pick a mare because the mare is really what re really predetermines what your foal is going to look like. I don't know if you guys have noticed, but you know, if you have a mare, they got a little bit of an offset right knee, normally, I mean, usually those foals always come out really looking like the mare with that little bit of an offset right knee. So if you, can get, if you can get the right mare, and someone was talking earlier about budget, I think I'd rather have a really, in this marketplace, in this day and age, I'd rather have a good physical, give up a little pedigree, 
and have a real good physical than have a lot of pedigree and have a bad physical because the way the market is right now, everybody's looking for the perfect physical. So I'm going to start from the bottom, which is the hoof. Mike had mentioned that, you know, you want a really good hoof, and you do. You want a really solid, good hoof, a nice big hoof, uh, something that's in proportion to the rest of the horse, something that's pro proportion, but you want a good solid ho hoof. You don't want a shelly a hoof. You don't want a hoof with a lot of lines in it. You don't want a hoof that uh, is flat-footed. And you don't want a hoof that has a contracted heel. And you don't want a, a big horse on a little tiny, tiny foot. Because that foot has to take all the concussion when that horse is running. Moving up from the hoof. And don't be afraid to pick hoofs up at the sales if you want to really take a look at a horse. If you're really interested in a horse and you're really going to invest, a horse, invest in a horse, whether you do it while the horse is out or you ask to see the horse in the stall, if you really like a horse, Pick the horse's foot up, look at the frog, make sure it's a nice, solid, good, healthy, spongy frog and a good, solid, a, a good, solid hoof. I used to have a friend of mine years ago, he used to use, have his thumb, use his thumb as a measurement and measure uh, the side of each hoof from the bulb of the heel and measure to make sure that they didn't do really a lot of corrective, uh, a, a lot of corrective trimming by using his thumb. Just do it. And, he, and he did that in like two minutes while he was looking at the horse in the stall. The next thing, the pastern. You want a nice angle of the pastern. You don't want a pastern that's too long and slopey. When the horses walk, you don't want them to really, that pastern to slope down and hit the ground. You want it to have strength in that pastern. And then moving up from the pastern, you want a nice short cannon here. This is the cannon bone here, right below the knee. You want a nice short, solid cannon bone. That cannon bone is, is actually going, is, is like the bow of a bow and arrow and the tendon being the string. This tendon on the back coming down the leg here and going around the ankle to the hoof is going to put a lot of stress on that cannon bone. So like having a stick, you know, if you have a long stick, they're very easy to bend. If you have a short stick, they're very tough to bend. So you want a nice short cannon, and then if you have a short cannon, hopefully you've got a nice long, a nice long forearm, which is going to give you your reach when the horse is walking. In, in the back, you want the, the, the angles to match, you want the hooves to match, you want the lengths to match, and then you want a nice 45-degree angle to the gaskin and a nice big muscular gaskin moving up into a nice big muscular stifle. Um, here you want a nice big shoulder right here. The lungs fill up the whole rib cage. So you want a nice deep girth, a nice big shoulder. But one of the most important things that I think people uh, neglect, you ha I don't like the neck on this horse. I think this horse should have a longer neck. You want length to the neck. Because essentially horses walk on. Horses have to move forward. And the center of gravity of the horse should be a little bit forward rather than back. So if you have like quarter horses, if you know quarter horses, quarter horses tend to be a big muscular horse, tend to have a little bit of a shorter neck. They don't have big long necks on them. They run a quarter of a mile, that's it. They, they get going as fast as they can, they run a quarter of a mile as fast as they can and they're done. Thoroughbreds have to run a mile, mile and a sixteenth, mile and an eighth, mile and a half, mile and three quarters. So you want length to the neck so you get a nice, what they call, balance. Um, what I do just from a really simple, just from visually trying to determine balance on a horse, is I'll start here, right here, and in my, with my eye, draw a line from here to the point of the shoulder, and then draw a line from the point of the hip to the point of the shoulder, and those lines, hopefully, will be equidistant, and that will give me the length of the neck that I'm looking for to really give that horse a nice long reach. So when you have the long forearm and you got nice length to the neck, you should see that horse really reach out, put its head down and reach out when it walks. And then when you have the nice angle to the gaskin in the back, that those hind legs come under and grab and then push. So the front of the horse reaches out, the back of the horse pushes. So you have locomotion. 
Now, when we look at horses at the sale, I think the first thing, before we get into all the details of towing in, towing out, and annular things in the knees and hocks and things like that, I think is when you, when you first go to a sale, whether you're buying a broodmare or a yearling or a weanling, you know, I think it's your first impression. Like when I ask to see horses at a sale, we've already done our homework in the catalog as much as we can do in the catalog. You want to look at as many horses as you possibly can. Just don't pick out four or five. Go and look at a, a whole bunch because you never know where that good horse is going to come from. You want to see that horse come out of the stall and really your first impression when that horse comes out is, is it what you expected by what you were reading in the pedigree? When that horse comes out of the stall, do you go, wow, you know, that's a nice horse because that's the impression that you want. Then instead of having the horse stop and start picking it apart, I like to see that horse walk. Have him walk a, away from me, walk to me, and then stand on the side and watch the horse walk back and forth. Now these horses have been standing in these stalls at sales all day. And that's all they do. All they do is stand in the stalls. They'll walk them in the morning while they're, doing the, while they're doing the stalls. But essentially, they go back into the stalls, they get rubbed on, and then they're brought out just to be shown. So a lot of times, if you're early at the sale or it's, or it's later in the day, these horses are a little stiff by standing. So you really want to give them a chance to walk and really show themselves before you really start really looking at them carefully. So I like to let a horse walk walk back and forth four or five times, six times, or if there's a circle, let them walk around the circle and really get warmed up and really, and really get comfortable with, and relaxed and let them show properly. So then once, we, once you start watching the horse really walk towards you and towards you and away from you, then you start looking at some of the details. So here are the perfect here are the perfect situations here. here. Here are the themes. This is a normal front end where if you drop a perpendicular from the shoulder, it should bisect the knee, bisect the hoof. Again, shoulder, bisect the knee, bisect the hoof. Looking from the side, dropping from the point of the shoulder, bisect, per perfect 45 degree angle right to the bottom of the hoof. Gaskin, same thing. Now these are perfect. These are diagrams, you know, the, it's, it, it doesn't always happen this way. Here are some of the variations on that theme. So you have base narrow, base wide, offset knees, knock knees, bow legs. I, I think this is probably something I can't live with because like, like Seth said before, you're going to get a lot of wear and tear on these ankles because when these horses, these heavy animals, hit the ground, a lot, of that, a lot of that stress is gonna hit them right in the ankles. Some of these other things, like right here, in a, in a knock knee situation, you're gonna, get your, you're gonna get a lot of your stress right on the outside points of these knees, here on the inside point of this knee, you're gonna get wear and tear. Not to say that horses can't run with a lot of these various uh, variations of, of perfect conformation, but it's eventually going to affect their longevity. It's gonna affect their soundness, and it's gonna affect the longevity of how long they last. Um, it's interesting, we come to the yearling sales here in Saratoga, and we watch the yearlings, and we're looking for the perfect yearlings, and then we walk across to the races, and we go into the paddock, and you watch the horses in the paddock, and you say to yourself, whoa. And, and I'm talking about in the paddock for grade one, grade two, grade three races, where, where you have race mares that have already earned half a million dollars. You have horses that are you know, on their way to the Triple Crown or the Peter Pan getting ready for the Travers. And you, know, you see some things that if you were to buy them, you probably wouldn't have, but guess what? They don't know how they're built. They don't know who their father is. They don't know who their mother is, and they don't know how much they cost. They just want to run. And that's probably one of the things that, you know, really makes this a great game is that the horses don't know how they look. They just, either they want to run or they don't. And it doesn't matter really what they look like, what they cost, or what sale they went through. You really don't know that until you get them out there in their first race in the afternoon and, and, and see what they can do. Um, from the standpoint of sales and x-raying and things like that. I mean, we have, like Mike was saying, there's a repository. So you go around, you look at your horses. In my case, since I have a very limited budget, 
I actually hope to find things on the x-rays. I hope to find things that I can live with and that will scare other people away, especially a lot of uh, who we call pin hookers or resellers. Um, they are going to take their offspring from, let's say, a weanling sale to a yearling sale or a yearling sale to a two-year-old sale. They're going to be looking for squeaky clean x-rays, and if not, they're going to be looking for things on the x-rays that they can correct. So if I see something on an x-ray, and this is all based on, of course, the veterinarian that you use. I like veterinarians with very gray hair. <laughs> very gray hair. The grayer, the better. Or, or, or less hair than me, but gray. Because these guys have been around for years and years, and they've been around since maybe before x-ray machines were being used. Not that old. Um, but, you know, they've seen a thousand variations of things that they've seen on x-rays, and they've tracked some of these horses to see, or their clients have kept in touch with them to tell them that whatever that horse had didn't bother them on the racetrack. And I ha have had myself horses that we actually couldn't offer for sale because of veterinary issues that we found doing forecast x-rays that we had mentioned before. We didn't even offer them for sale because we knew we were gonna get dinged to the point where we were gonna give the horse away so we ended up putting the horse in training, and the horses go out and win uh, $190,000, $200,000. And that's happened multiple times. So, like I said, the two markets are totally different. Your racehorse market is different, very different from your yearling market. So it's, it's, and from the standpoint of being a breeder and offering horses for sale, you know, it, it's good to really get on, and this is the reason why we have these, these seminars and everybody's spoken, it's because the sooner you can get on some of these small things or anything that you find, the sooner you make those corrections or work with your blacksmith or your veterinarian, the less problems you're going to have later on when you go to the sales and something shows up, you know, shows up on an x-ray. Um, the only thing, the, going back to, um, wait a second, right here. Another thing I wanted to mention is that I forgot, and I apologize. Right here, the head. When I look at yearlings or I look at broodmares, I like to see a lot of space between the eyes. I like to see a nice, wide head. And the reason I, uh, I want to see a nice, wide head is because usually if you have wide set eyes and a wide head, you're going to have a lot of room. You're going to have wide space between the mandibles Underneath the, horse's, underneath the horse's skull. And what I still do, which is a little bit old-fashioned, is after I look at a horse and I like him enough to really maybe have my vet look over the x-rays or whatever, I look at him, I'll come back, look at him a second time, I will stick my fist underneath his, underneath his head to see if my fist will fit between his mandibles. Because you really, if a horse, not only if a horse has bad feet, they can't run, but if they can't breathe, they can't run. Because this whole horse is muscle. This whole horse is muscle. And all that muscle has to be, has to be replenished by oxygenated blood. Uh, it's like 140 times a minute or something. It's some crazy, crazy amount of blood that flo flows through that gigantic body. So you have to have a good throat. A horse has to be able to, to breathe and have that exchange of oxygen and CO2 going in and out unimpeded. Um, so what we'll do is we will probably, before we even read the x-rays or do a set of x-rays, if that's necessary, we'll scope the horse first to make sure that that airway is big, obstructed, a, a nice unobstructed airway that's big and, and is really, an, I like to call it a, a Brooklyn tunnel. I, my vets know that, that when I scope horse, I'm looking for the Brooklyn tunnel, you know, the Brooklyn battery tunnel. That's what I like in a horse's throat. I like to have a nice, big, giant throat because you have to have that in order for a horse to breathe, in order for them to run. So I guess that's about it. Do you have any, qu any questions? So what we're going to do now is a panel Q&A with uh, the four of you for some set questions that we have and, and material that is relevant to everything that Tom just covered um, from a buyer's perspective and a seller's perspective as well. Um, so what I'm going to do is, is ask a few of these questions and uh, get each of your perspective and 
individually some different perspectives. And then at the same time, uh, if there's any questions from the audience that are relevant to this material or the answers that they bring up, um, we can have you interject into those as well. So first one I have is, um, I'm just curious, just to give a perspective on this, how many horses do you raise in a year, Seth? Uh, anywhere from two to six, depending on how many mares decide to cooperate, get in full, stay in full. Lois? Uh, pretty much anywhere, eight, 10 on upwards to mid 20s, depending on the year. And Mike? Uh, 20 to 20 of my own in Kentucky with another, well, however many, probably 60 of our own here in New York. We have 12 broodmares on our farm. We just have a small farm. And uh, then I manage various, uh, probably another 20 to 25 for clients, either in training or um, going to the sales. So I, I think that if there's a list of Q&A questions on here, and I think probably one of the ones that stands out to me that I think is interesting for people to hear is, is yearling or weanling size or foaling date important to you for sales placement? So the size and the foaling date, how important is that to you for placement and sale, where you're going to go, the selection process of who is going to be included based on that? Tom, why don't you start? Um, my cutoff for the summer sales is like April, April 15th. And the reason for that is, um, you know, the summer sales, traditionally, first of all, from a, from a mother nature point of view, Horses and all animals stop growing at the end of the summer and start to fill in. They start to store for the winter. So you'll get, you'll get that upward growth will stop, and then all of a sudden they'll start to fill in. And I've seen yearlings that look horrible during the summer just look beautiful in the fall. So if you're working with foaling dates, I try and cut off at around April, between April 1st and April 15th try and target those horses for the summer sales and see if they get there properly. Sometimes they'll pull like a growth spurt just before the sale or something like that, depending on their, their genetic predisposition. But, you know, you really want your horse to come to the sale the best he's ever looked and the best he's ever going to look because you want to get the best money at the sale. So um, I know everybody's like focused on the select sales and the preferred sale and all that, but We've sold really, really well in Maryland and also in October, Phasic Tipton and September, Keeneland, based on just saving a horse that we thought was physically immature and letting them mature. And then once you get to the fall, you've got like a totally different horse and they, they just sell well. So I think you really have to, it's not about the sale, it's more about where does your horse fit the best. Go ahead, Mike. I, I think it's puberty. I mean, you're talking about young, immature animals that become more masculine or feminine as they get older. And, uh, you know, it's letting nature do the hard work for you. I mean, you, you can, with a May full, you can't push as hard as you can. He's just not built for it. You know, a lot of the work that we do in the round pen and, and exercising horses, I mean, you're not going to get the same return until that horse is mature enough that, is, that his testosterone level is going to help you. Um, you know, obviously, we're not injecting horses with testosterone anymore. That's how people used to do that. Um, now you've got to let you let the animal do it for you. The animal matures, he hits the spurt Tom's talking about, and and all of a sudden the muscles just start coming. And all you've got to do is stand back and keep him happy and and keep him from running through fences. Um, you know, that that becomes the the trick of it to me is the mental work because you. You, you do let these horses get to be more mature and get them to be bigger, stronger athletes. Uh, and then the thing is to keep them happy, healthy, and safe so that they show well and sell well. Yeah, I pretty much agree with both uh, Tom and Mike, but every once in a while you will get a horse that is outside your normal parameter. Um, we have one now that's a colt that was born the first week of May and his size and scope, um, are, he's actually larger than some that we have that were from uh, February. So I, I don't have a hard and fast rule, but you do have to take a look at them and take size, maturity, and uh, age into consideration. 
And I think Lois just touched on it. It's, again, an individual. I um, mean, for example, last year I had a colt that um, FASIC came out and looked at for the preferred sale. They accepted him. He was a May, May 2nd foal. And I was a little concerned about his maturity. So I said, you know what? You want him, but the last time I, I took a foal, it was a late April foal uh, to the preferred sale. I got beat up. We are in aid, and we had to go back to October where we sold well. So I said, you know what? I'm just going to wait on this guy. Uh, we did, and we sold him for 75000 in October. He was uh, by a stallion that stood for 7500 so it was a good turn. Um, but I had a feeling that if I actually run him to the ring at preferred, he probably would have brought six figures um, just because of the way the market is. There's a smaller, a smaller pool of horses for people to buy from. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's no hard and fast rule. Talk to, talk to the representatives from the sales company when they come out and look. Um, always seems like, uh, for me, if they say this is where we want them, that's where they need to be. Mike, what, what makes your program for developing and selling yearlings different? Well, we're, um, we're primarily pin hooking in Kentucky versus in New York, we're raising horses. Um, and so in Kentucky, we're buying horses that average around 125 to 150,000 per horse and trying to sell them for north of 300. Um, they're, they're typically very correct horses. They're typically vet clean horses. Um, it's different obviously because they're, you're hoping you don't have the problems that we talked about up here. You're actually selecting not to have those problems. So um, what I find is the difference maker for me selling them is, is horsemanship. I mean, I, I do a very thorough job of, of having that horse just about as close to ready for tack as as he can be. I mean, I don't break my horses and put them under tack, but they're in sur singles, they're in long lines, they're uh, they're lunged, they're driven, um, they're ponied sometimes. Um, when I when my horses come out to show for Bill Mott, they're going to stand there and they're going to stand there like soldiers. And when they're asked to walk, they're going to step off with a smart step and and a bright look in them and their ears forward. Um, because in my in the level of the game that I'm playing at, I can't afford to have a horse refuse to walk or not go in his stall or act like he's never done this before. So I think that the, um, what's different, what, what all of you should be thinking about is that when someone, how this applies to your life, is that when someone comes to look at your horse, one of the things that you can control, which we have not talked about at all, is how that horse shows himself. And I think it's one of the areas that can definitely be improved on by or everyone in the room, myself included, but they, you, you've got to spend the time to work on that horse to get him to look intelligent and look like he's had a lot of time. And you would be surprised, and I know Tom's a consigner here and he'll tell you, um, we consign as well, you will get horses shipped to you that have not had any handling at all and be asked to sell them to good horse people. And it is very difficult to do. Um, Seth has worked for some of the best horsemen in New York and believe me when they have half an hour to come look at 10 horses the last thing they want to see from you as a show person is a little bucket of grain and come on into the stall they don't want to watch that yeah. and they just and they're polite if they do but they really have very busy and we have a very tight window as a preferred sale consigner with these big-time ultra uh, professional buyers uh, to give them a very quick glimpse of, of an excellent animal. So you really want to focus on that at home, uh, and, and that's what we do to differentiate ourselves. Yeah, so you jumped right into the next part of this that I think is really important is, um, you know, what are some of those secrets to, to teaching a horse to show well and, and knowing that they're ready? And I think it's, it's something that New York needs to be better at, right? I mean, we get you know, sometimes not for how our horses show at certain sales that people might, you know, someone mentioned earlier on the panel, the, the pride factor. You know, everyone believes that they have the right horse and there's a, the most beautiful horse and you've done everything right. It's absolutely a six-figure animal, even though whatever its pedigree says or whatever the stud feed might have been, even though it was free. So how, how can, what are the secrets and what are some of the, the pieces that you would give as feedback to people um, 
that might get them more success when they bring their horse to a sale, that they're show ready, um, and even from a, you know preparation to the point of which they're handing it over to a consigner. Well, I think you can't be all things. You know, I think you have to concentrate your operation on what your a specialty is. You know, because when you get to a point like Mike says, the the current buyers are are very very particular and very professional and they, they don't have time to really, even though you love your horse and don't worry, he, he'll do it, he'll do it, don't worry, I can get him to you, don't worry, he'll come out of the stall. No, they don't want to hear that. It's a, the, to them, it's not a cutesy pie thing anymore. When you come to the sale, these are people buying, essentially they're buying agricultural commodities. They're buying commodities where they're going to resell them or, or, or train them. So I think that you have to come to grips with the fact that if you can't properly raise a yearling or prep a yearling, um, then give it to um, your sales agent to prep. Uh, if you think that the horse, if the horse has been accepted to a decent sale and you think you have you know, a horse that's going to bring uh, upwards of 60, 70, 80,000 mm -hmm. and you've spent, like you said, seven or eight or 10 percent of that on the stud fee, then you can afford to pay a professional to prep that horse. Um, if you can't or you don't want to, then I think it's a matter of handling that horse every single day, keeping it on a routine, getting into a sales prep, a proper sales prep routine. And I think the main thing is routine for a horse. I mean, if you just do the same thing every single day and you work at it, that horse will respond you know, will respond to you if you don't have the time or you got to pick the kids up at school or somebody calls or something happens or you're, you're, you have another livelihood that you're trying to take care of, then by all means, um, find a sales agent that can provide proper sales prep and, and just let them do it because, you know, you've got a, a lot of time, a lot of money, you've got years invested in this horse and you want them to show at his best on that day that, he, that, that he's at the sale. Seth, what do you think? Well, I think it all starts um, from the moment that foals a, a few minutes old. I um, mean, start handling them. Play with their ears, play with their head, play with their legs. Um, get them accustomed to humans so that they're comfortable with them, comfortable in their surroundings. Um, I know I do one thing, I'm a big guy, and this is something I, I can't even remember who, who taught me this, but um, foals, if you let them get away with everything, they're going to run over top of you. They're quick, they're fast. Um, so years ago, uh, someone said, look, bear hug that thing, okay? So I do. I, they get a bear hug, and they get held. If they fight, they get held on to until they decide that, okay, it's time for me to stop. And they develop an understanding that, okay, this guy's smaller than me, but he still can control me. And I think that's really important. I mean, you get a couple that actually get picked up because they are a little bit less willing to give in. Um, so that's important. Again, um, Tom touched on it with repetition. I think every time you put a, put a, a lead rope on that foal, you want to move him forward, okay? Mike talked about that. Keep them moving forward. Don't let them salt and suck back. And every time you stop with them, from the time they're foals, if you can work on getting them to set themselves up. I think there's a picture or two up there. We know what they're supposed to look like when they're at the sale. Get them to set up. And after a while, it just becomes second nature to them. And you know, if you work on getting their ears up and you stick your hand in front of their nose, they're going to pop those ears up and do what you need them to when they're at the sales. I think um, one thing to be really conscious of is your help. It, it, we all know that it's hard. First, let's applaud all the students that are here. I think that's really cool because we're going to need people to work with our horses. So, <laughs> Believe me, all, all of you young people, if you can do some of the things that we're talking about here, you will have a good job because there is a shortage of people that are really skilled at what we're talking about. So um, if, if your help learns to set up horses like Seth is saying and show horses well, um, you, your horses will, it, it becomes habitual to them. They learn, they learn where to be. I mean, um, the, the, uh, you know, in my program, we start, I'm just talking about yearling prep, you know, we start just by walking and, and invariably there will be somebody 
on the first day of, of walking yearlings, that'll be, you know, the horse will be trailing along behind them like this, and you, you have to train your help to walk the way you want them to walk. Mm -hmm. You have to get them back by the shoulder and driving the horse forward with their, with their left hand and, and making the horse walk. Um, I mean, two things are going to happen if they don't. One is the horse is eventually going to jump on their back and knock them down and be loose and running all over your farm. Uh, and the other one is that the horse is never going to learn to walk right and is always going to walk like a, a pet. And I haven't seen Bill Mott buy any pets lately. You know, he doesn't do it. So if you want to sell to people that have serious money and, and that train serious horses, and, and I should note we've got another really good trainer right in the room here, Jimmy Bond is over there too. Mm -hmm. If you want to sell to people like, like Jimmy Bond, you're, you're not going to be able to show them Lassie. I mean, that sucker's not going to be able to be back here and walking around and getting a stroke on the head. He's got a dog. His name's Charlie, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I yeah. had the name wrong. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, you, you want that horse forward and ears up, and, and racehorses that go backwards never win. He's got to be dragging the show person. So I think those, you know, that to me, um, you know, as we progress through walking for 10 minutes to walking for 20 minutes to into the round pen to doing the 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 on the ground work, um, train that horse to be forward and, and responsive and aggressive without being on top of you to recognize your space and to move his feet when you come closer to him rather than the other way around. Um, you know, understand the boundary Seth's talking about of, of that he's not going to get away with things by, by overpowering you. Those are, the, those are the things that the trainers are looking for at the sale. Um, you know, lots of Lots of buyers are looking at five cross pedigrees and uh, vet reports and everything else, but the guy that's handling the horse that's probably going to have a lot to do with the end decision in a lot of these cases is looking at what you've done to make that horse trainable. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if you just look at repetition, it's kind of funny. My first mare was a mare that I trained at the racetrack. She was injured. Her owner gave her to me. I sent her home to my dad. My dad was a dairy farmer, very... You know, horses were a nuisance to him, but he decided to let me send her home. Uh, she had an injury that needed a little help, uh, needed a little help to overcome. But um, uh, so my family would come to give him a hand, and he, they actually kind of thought he was a mystic because he'd reach down to pick up her left front, and she'd pick it up. He'd drop it to pick the next foot. She'd pick the next one up. And she would go around in order for him. So they thought he was a, an amazing horse trainer. And it was just repetition with her. She'd done it every single day from the time she was broke to the time she went home. And she knew left front, right front, left hind. Or right, right hind, left front, left hind. And she was done and over with. And, and hey, my day's going to go on. So it's just really important. Keep that repetition going. How about from the audience? Any questions relevant to sales prep, getting a horse that you've bred or involved with to the sale before we move on to the buying side of things. Looks like, there's quite, looks like there's quite a few, so which is good. Mike said he does some uh, lunging, and that is of yearlings, and how long, how often, and how young? Well, we usually start, uh, you know, if a, if a September horse, well, let's see, if an August horse starts on May 1, that's usually when we start prep. We start the Monday after the Derby. Um, you know, we'll walk for 30 days, gradually increasing, you know, 10 minutes a week until we get to 30 minutes. And then we'll start uh, flag work in the ring and um, probably lunging without tack first, just, um, you know, the horse in the ring. It, you have to have a really good round pen for this. I wouldn't recommend you do this in a paddock. <laughs> but if you have a good round pen, it'll make prepping your yearling a hundred times easier. And by a good round pen, I mean a, a good 60-foot round pen with, with good footing. But um, free lunging your horse first at, you know, um, you know, since, as Tom said, you're talking about mostly horses born before April. Uh, you're talking about horses that are uh, 14 months old. I guess that's, uh, a, I don't know if that's a, you know, we're, all, we're talking about individuals. I mean, I, I've taken May horses to the July sale and, and lunged them going into the July sale. So um, everybody's different. Um, but be careful. I mean, don't overdo it. I think that's an important thing, too. 
We'll, we'll lunge horses five days a week and rarely for more than 10 to 11 minutes. Other questions? Other questions, there's Thank a bunch you. out there. I was just curious, where, what do you guys feel about having the heart scores done for the sales and how w much would that influence buyers to get a good heart score and have it there on the hip there as a... Questions date? about heart scores. I think Mike's the man. Yeah, I, I used to do a lot of heart <laughs> scoring from, from 1995 to 99 half of 2000 I did um, I worked for Equix biomechanics and did heart scores and measuring and uh, I found that it was very valuable uh, certainly in identifying elite sort of uh, horses in particular if you were uh, spending a lot of money I also found though that like many things when you're when you're kind of force fed by a seller here's a great heart score here's a great heart score here's an A plus plus Nick something, something kind of weird about that I mean, to me, I want to fall in love with the horse first and then decide if I want to buy it or not. I mean, I, you know, um, that, maybe that's just me personally. Um, and there's a soft sell way to do that that's fine and not pushy, and I think that's okay. You know, I mean, uh, Bill Wilmot, you know, before the OBS April sale said, don't forget to look at hip number so-and-so. I really like that horse, and we bred him. I think that's great. But, you know, what I don't like is, is the... Uh, this overwhelming amount of information coming at me that I really don't want to find out until I decide if I like the horse or not. From the seller's point of view, if they've come to scope your horse and then you have a repository report and then they do a heart score, you've probably got somebody interested in your horse. So from a seller's point of view, you can sort of forecast how much interest you have in your horse because a heart scan, how much does a heart scan cost? I don't use them. Six, 600, five, 600, I think. But they, they can charge less than that. They, some of the heart scans are equal to scopes. Oh, really? Anyway, in the old days, it used to be quite a bit of money, so they had a lot of money invested in your horse, so you pr probably were pretty safe that you were going to sell that horse. It's definitely an indication that the buyer is still on your horse. Let's leave it at that. I mean, if it gets through the shortlist guy and then the trainer or the bloodstock agent, and then the owner comes and rubs on it and loves it, and then the next guy comes and heart scans it, well... It's progressing through the hoops, and that's and, what Tom means. You know it's getting closer. And then when the wife comes by and asks what she should name the horse, then you're in. Or if they, then if run in and run in and, and put the reserve up. And if they're Japanese, they take pictures with it. <laughs> Video too. <laughs> in the blue. I just have a question. Um, last year, I did my own consignment for a couple of yearlings in the October sale, and. One of the thoughts that I had had was, you never see what the mare looks like. Everybody knows what the stallion looks like. They all, you know, and you can look at the, the page. So I actually put on, on a little computer program pictures of the two, the, my two mares. You know, side picture, front picture, back picture. And I had quite a few people that, that thought that was, was a really good idea. Um, it, do you think there was any value in doing that? I, I guess I would. I don't know you or, or which mares you were talking about, what your pedigrees are. If you have a mare like Courtly D, I would say yes. Take a picture, nah. show it to everybody. Um, I think if you have an average mare, um, I don't know that it would bring a whole lot to the decision. Yeah. But if you have breeding stock, I, that's why I say Courtly D was a brood mare of the year umpteen times. Um, well, I think twice. But um, if you have breeding stock, I think knowledge of what the female family looks like is really important. Yeah, I don't, the, what the mayor looks like um, doesn't have, bear a lot of relevance insofar as what the yearling looks like at that point in time. You know, if they, they either look like an athlete or not, if mom looks like an athlete and they walk like a duck and act like a duck, they're still a duck. They're going to quack like one. Um, I think the only time that, you know, when you think about uh, mayor and offspring interaction that, uh, Sometimes it's useful as if you're trying to sell them, unload a mare and she's got a really good looking foal. Then you probably want to have them placed in a sale near each other uh, so that you can go, oh, look at this baby. And then, hey, mom's for sale too. But I just have one comment about selling yearlings in mixed sales. 
you really should try and sell yearlings in yearling sales. Um, I think you're hurting yourself a little bit if you put a yearling in a mixed sale. Um, you know, yearling buyers, you get a ton of yearling buyers at yearling sales. At mixed sales, you're going to get mostly, you know, when there's a much bigger book of weanlings, like I think last year there was like 100 weanlings in the October sale. A little bit more than that. Yep. 40 yearlings, maybe. Yep. You know, you're, the bulk of your buyers are going to be weanling pin hookers to yearlings. And then people that are up here, like even myself, like say, oh, we got some yearlings in the sale, might as well take a look at them. But you're not going to really get the, you're not in the right marketplace. You know, if you got a real nice shiny apple, sell it with the rest of the apples. You, you know uh -huh. what I'm saying? So that's just something to think about. Unless a set of circumstances forces you to do it. But if you can get, even if, if you don't get accepted to the preferred sale, it's not like the end of the, you don't have to go out and like Harry carry. You know what I'm saying? It's, there are plenty of other good, solid yearling markets that in, including the September Keeneland sale and the October phasic Tipton Kentucky sale that are really good solid yearling markets where you have a ton of demand. And Mid-Atlantic also can be a good spot and, and to And the Mid-Atlantic is it, now you, coming you back. You tend you know. to get more end users there. Right. Yeah, I mean, you look at the numbers, there's 1,600 foals in New York. 300 of them are cataloged for the summer sale. 20%, top 20%. So the reality is, I mean, obviously 100% of the foals born here are not commercial or the intent of being commercial. But the, the, the large lion's share of them are not going into that sale. So those other markets are really important. And understanding the buyer's base based on those markets is even more important. So um, I think that's probably one of the most valuable pieces of information you can go away with. Uh, what other questions relevant to um, uh, selling? still on the selling side. Sandy. Just had a question about sending weanlings to Florida to kind of grow up over the winter versus keeping them here. Historically, I've just sent them, you know, in October or November to spend the winter in Florida. And this year I have some of my own that I'm keeping at home. And I'm just wondering if you've noticed a difference in their maybe growth rates or their coats or anything about their... Well, you'll definitely notice a difference in their coats. <laughs> That's quick and easy. Um, you know, I think, is it a little bit easier on them down there? Do they get grass all the time? But I don't, uh, yes. Um, but if you have a good feeding program here, I don't think they're that any further behind. Um, you know, I guess bear in mind that horses actually do like the cold. Um, they're animals that evolved in cold environments. Um, so, there's always going to be that argument back and forth, Florida, New York, but I don't think we're at too much of a detriment as long as you feed properly and provide adequate shelter. No. I, I do actually the same thing. I, I separate, we separate our yearlings into sales and race, and the race, the race horse, the sales yearlings go to Kentucky, and the race horses, the, the ones we want to race, or two-year-old sales go right to Florida. The reason I like going to Florida is, you know, I like my horses to be raised in a 40, 50, 60 acre field. I don't have a 40, 50, 60 acre field on my farm that I can save specific, I don't have one to begin with. I think the biggest uh, field I have is like 10 or, 10 or 11 acres, but essentially we're a broodmare nursery. We broodmare and babies, and that's what we've come to specialize in. So I really like my horses to go down and be raised in big giant fields so they're not limited. They're limited by their, them getting tired, not limited by a fence. So I, that, so I like to do it for that, for that reason. Not so much the weather, but the weather also, but really just to be able to get out there and run in a herd. You know, you want them to really, horses need to be horses running a herd. So I like that reason to do that. I, I would agree with that. I mean, uh, I think horses in large groups and large spaces are happier, healthier, probably more athletic horses. I, I like what Seth said a lot because here in New York we raise a lot of horses outside in sheds um, and we produce a lot of horses that are really sound horses and I think that cold is actually good for horses to be sound. I don't, I, you know, you, you take care of a horse, you know, when you're working in a barn and you're cold 
and you're saying, well, close all the doors, close all the windows so that it's, so that it's comfortable in here for me, you know, you're kind of doing the wrong thing. I mean, horses are, are made to be cold. They've got hair on them, you know. I mean, you, horses are outside in, in the wintertime, and they're, they're just fine as long as they've got free choice hay and good water. Um, so um, on the other hand, if you want to sell horses in the July sale in particular, um, you know, you'll make your life a lot easier by starting your prep in a warmer area. I mean, um, you know, typically I'm on my fields uh, 30 to 45 days before John's on our fields here. I mean, as far as doing tractor work, as far as dragging, as far as seeding, as far as anything. I mean, our spring comes 45 days earlier in Lexington than it does in Saratoga. So that's a 45 day advantage. I've got to get everything ready, which if I'm, make, if I'm trying to make the July sale is a big advantage. Now, if I'm trying to make the September sale, it really doesn't matter because honestly, we're gonna both start on June 1. And by June 1, he's all caught up and we're on the same schedule anyway. But if I'm trying to make that early sale in August for a horse, if I was taking a May horse to Saratoga, I'd consider starting him, you know, earlier. But, but that's the timing thing that you're talking about and it has to do with what your weather is and what your winter is and what your farm can handle, like Tom said. So let's talk about the buying side here for the next 10 minutes. Um, Mike, what, what's your buying process? You're, you're, you're coming to uh, Saratoga this summer. Um, you, I know part of your process, you're coming here before then too. Um, tell people what, what goes through your head, what's part of your strategy uh, and what you're gonna buy in terms, of, I guess, from a yearling's perspective. Well, we, we always buy um, a dozen yearlings every year and um, I've bought yearlings from a lot of familiar faces in this room and um, in some cases for some of the people in this room. Um, you know, I, I guess if in, in an oversimplified one word answer, I look for quality. Uh, I kind of liked what everybody on this panel has said so far. I, I'm very much like Tom. I like, I like something that really strikes me right off the box. I would caution those of you without much experience not to use that until you have experience. Um, because I think that was something, you know, like if, uh, if your seven year old daughter is really struck by it, that shouldn't be really, really, really high. <laughs> you you want to have a really good idea what a good first impression is. But I, I do like a good first impression. Um, we work the horse from pedigree based on our notes from the weanling sales, based on our notes on the mothers of the horses, and based on the notes of the older two-year-olds and three-year-olds in the horse. So we, we do have what we call our green list before the sale starts, which is basically the mares that we feel are the good producers. And those are the mares we really focus on. But we look at every new mare, especially younger mares, or mares that have kind of just reached the radar by just producing a stakes horse maybe for the first time. We look at those maybe more second, they're our second priority after our green list. So we kind of come in with things sort of um, grouped and we spend a thorough, I think a thorough job looking at the horses uh, like Tom said, we, we kind of do, you know, I, I'm in particular very interested in what the seller's veterinarian says about the x-rays because I find that, and you, you learn to handicap these veterinarians, some of them are really tough and they don't need to be, and others are really easy and they should be tougher. But you learn who's who, and you learn if that's going to create a problem for the seller. And if that creates a problem for the seller, I'm really interested because that means I'm going to get a little value off of their vet report not being, not being right or maybe too accurate or too lax. So I think learning how to handicap those vet reports is good. And then the, you know, the final, you know, after you've looked at it two or three times and totally tipped your hand, as Tom says, uh, you know, the, the, the final piece is actually vetting the horse yourself. Um, again, I'm, I'm very fortunate to be married to a veterinarian who is very practical and thank God doesn't have less hair than Tom or gray hair, um, but, but she does Thank work, <laughs> it would be bad. Um, she, does, she does work uh, with uh, 100 horses in training every day and on a farm that raises 140 really well-bred, hyper-managed yearlings. And, and so she has incredible experience as far as that goes. So when we vet horses, we're also looking for uh, things and um, you know, I, I, Bourbon Courage, who's probably the most, 
valuable horse I bought for the least amount of money was a $15,000 horse who vetted a little bit questionably in his knee. And um, he was vetted six times. The owner of the horse told us he was so popular. I, I had 75000 to spend for him. I got him for twelve. Uh, you know, and um, I, p members of my team were fraught with peril that we just stepped in a major hole. But I was high-fiving. I mean, I, I couldn't believe that we just got our pick of the sale for so little. So that, that horse made a million dollars, over a million dollars, and won graded stakes races, and won as, a, won as an early horse, and uh, was fantastic. Several times, as a racehorse, he was vetted for various reasons and was failed vet for the same knee that we passed him for as a yearling. So that will tell you that how, how critical it is that you understand your vet report well. And he still went on to win after oh. they failed him. Still oh, went. absolutely. That's absolutely. the killer. That's the killer. You know. I mean, they were failing him for something that he probably developed when he was three months old. That was an artifact uh, that was just part of him. You know, just like I've got a scar on my elbow. You know, and they were failing him for it year after year, or, you know, three times. And, and we had horses, they would do a soundness workup on him if he came out of a race tough and they'd x-ray his knee and they'd say, oh my God, this horse has got a line in his knee. No, no, he's always had that, you know. So that becomes a really important part. Once you've, once you've played around in this world of, of racing long enough, you will, you will learn that and the quicker you learn it, the better. Because when you have that and you're yearling, instead of getting all paranoid and scratching and all this sort of stuff or, or, or blabbing about to everyone at the auction, you, you, you get kind of a nice control, easy way of talking about it. And, and believe me, not everybody's going to understand it because they all don't have the experience either. A lot of these buyers are kids and people that really don't have the hands-on knowledge. But the people that know will believe you if you're credible. And, and that's the important distinction I make as far as selling a good horse. If you're credible and you're telling the honest to God truth, then they're going to give you a chance. They probably won't give you three chances if it goes wrong, but I mean, they're going to give you a chance. So pedigree, um, how does pedigree play a part in the selection process for any of you? Go ahead, Tom. I'm, I'm pretty old fashioned and um, I, I really look at pedigree. I really look deep into pedigree and I like to buy a nice page. Um, the thing that's going to limit uh, uh, my uh, is my budget, because sometimes you know you're trying to buy champagne with a beer budget. But I think pedigree is real important because over the years I've seen, no matter what horses how how they vetted or what they looked like, they seem to make a fool of everybody because they run to their they run to their genes, they run to their blood, and horses mares that over the years have produced winners and horses that know how to get to the finish line and want to get to the finish line, they produce athletes, will probably produce those over and over again, no matter what, uh, really, they'll move stallions up, no matter what stallion uh, they, you breed them to. So when I'm going through the catalog, I'm looking for mares that are gonna really deliver racehorses, and they've probably already delivered racehorses and then have a solid female family. I like to buy fillies. Because uh, at the end of the day, if you have a well-bred filly, she goes on to be a pretty good race. Not, doesn't have to be a spectacular race mare, but goes on to have uh, a, a decent race record. You know, they've got some real good residual value as broodmare prospects. Or if uh, they're inexpensive enough and they don't sell for big money, it's something that I'm thinking in terms of building a broodmare band later on with, this, with that family and trying to really develop that family uh, for myself. So I'm, 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 big, I'm, I'm pretty big on pedigree. Yeah, it's almost, here in New York, it's become such a lucrative environment to sell commercially. It's almost we've become, um, our success has is, is, is also led people to have expectations that maybe might be false hopes based on you know, wanting to be involved and wanting to be involved commercially, such that you know, we're breeding mares that are blank on blank and have an expectation that they're gonna bring that $80,000 sales average that happens here in Saratoga in August. Um, 
talk a little bit about that, anyone that wants to chime in on how, how our, our, our own success in this environment that we've created where it's, been, it's become very, very lucrative, so such that people want to be involved, but we're making decisions possibly um, based on false pretenses or some issues that, you know, which leads to having um, expectations that aren't, aren't met. I think the most important thing to always remember when you're selecting a broodmare is to understand it costs just as much to feed and maintain and breed a bad mare that it does a good mare. Um, again, go, go check those reports again, the, the, the buyer's guides. If, if the family never produces anything that makes any money, don't, uh, don't, uh, don't say, look at her and go, well, she's beautiful and have an illusion that, that, that um, you're going to succeed just because she's attractive. Um, if there's nothing on the page, you're up against it before you start. Again, Tom talks about good physicals. Good physicals are great, but there's that there's that combination of good physical and, uh, and page. I mean, you can walk in with a good physical that has three blank dams. They're not going to pay you for it. You're going to walk away hurt. So a few of these questions are all under the same pretense, such that what would you live with based on radiographs, based on the repository, based on scoping, um, heart scans, whatnot. Uh, Anyone wants to chime in on there? What, what, what is acceptable based on your budgetary constraints on what you're buying and what is an automatic toss out um, that comes across to you when, when you're doing your selection process? Like I said, I look for things. You, know, you know, if I'm looking at a horse and he's a, he or she is a big, good looking athletic horse from a, by a, a proven sire out of a, you know, a decent um, female family, I, I better find something, otherwise, I'm not going to be able to afford it. But that depends. I mean, I'm very picky about the scopes. I got to have like an A plus plus number one grade one, whatever you guys. Do. <laughs> there are more. There are more descriptions of throats, but I just have to have a good throat. And then, depending on what my veterinarian advises me as far as what we can live with on the radiographs, then that will, you know, if you have three marks on the repository page that's going to be like three knocks against that horse that might bring that horse down into my into my price range if there are things that my veterinarian that i'm using my sales veterinarian says this isn't a big deal this isn't a big deal and then if he sees something he's not sure of i might send him if i like the horse enough why don't you go ahead and take another view of that ankle and see if you really think it's going to bother that horse and then we may take additional x-rays but you know the more you find the cheaper the horses unfortunately the more you find that it's going to discount that horse and and hopefully you can get a, a good buy that's the, that's the term discounting so what what discounts do you live with mike how, how does that play a part differently than not you know anything different than what tom said which is summarizes it well. Well, I, I, do, I definitely do look for the x-ray discounts. Um, I, I don't, I will buy a 2A scope. I will, I love to buy, find ones. I love to find drain pipes is what we call them. He calls them the Brooklyn Tunnel. Um, but you know, you, you, you know, I'll usually scope 15 horses in each session or sometimes 20, uh, depending on how live I am in the market. Um, and you love to find one that's awesome. But I don't usually pass a 2A to go to a 1. I mean, unless the 2A is, you know, if a 2A comes in at a good price, I'm not going to be afraid of buying a 2A at all. Um, I don't buy 2Bs, so I guess that's where I draw the line. I, my feeling is that typically scopes get worse as horses get older and that 2Bs become 3s. So I know that. Um, from selling horses, though, it can be very frustrating. Your horse scopes great all year, and then all of a sudden it's sale day, and he doesn't scope. And we've all been there for that. Um, that's one of the mysteries of horses. I mean, um, video scoping is going to come in here shortly, and I think video scopes are a great thing because it's going to be nice as a seller to be able to say, look, I've got a video scope of this horse from last week. He was out at the farm, and he scoped great. That might let you keep a couple buyers in, but I think a lot of buyers, if he scopes bad the day of the sale, they're probably going to be pretty scared, and which is going to lead you to scratching and then going to a, a later sale. Um, the only other discount I, I would say that I get that I 
you know, just from experience. Um, you know, I, I do say I love to see a forward horse. If I see a, if I see a, a, a backwards horse that looks like he hasn't been worked with, I will, in some kind of macho way, feel like I can fix that horse and train him. And, uh, you know, that, that does intrigue me from time to time, and, and it's probably not my highest percentage shot, but it, it, it's a shot I'll take. Any questions from the audience? Tracy. What size paddocks, minimally, should weanlings and yearlings have access to so they can stretch their legs and practice being a racehorse? Is, is seven acres the standard per horse? It I used think to it be. used to be 10. It seems yeah. like it keeps dropping to an extent. And again, you, know, you can use that as a guideline, but then you also have to remember that stocking density is very important. Uh, so back years ago, I think when Mike and I were in, at Cornell, they used to say 10 acres per, per horse. Now they're probably using the guideline seven. Um, it seems like they, it continues to drop. Um, but that being said, you can use that as a, as a reference point, but you also have to consider stocking density, how many animals are in the individual area. Um, again, you know, the, the fewer animals, the smaller the area you can get away with, but um, I think when you're in, what your inspectors are probably talking about a lot of times is when they go to a place they're in a very small enclosure, knee deep in mud, uh, and that's a situation. You, right, well bigger, I mean, in this case bigger is better, it gives them more room. I mean, the, I guess the, the, the negative side of that is um, if you look at injuries, uh, the bigger the field, the faster they get going, and the greater chance they have of, of injuring themselves before you get them to the sales. I typically start my, I mean, all of our weanlings, obviously, I'm, I'm looking to see if my brother's still here. I don't think he is, but, you know, all of our weanlings are in larger groups and they're in larger fields. And then as horses are maturing you're, and as horses are getting ready for sales, you're pulling them out of the larger groups, usually in pairs or, you know, four. You know, some of our groups are 12 and 15, but they're, they're in 25 acre, 30 acre fields. So we're pulling them out of larger groups into smaller groups where they can be handled more and so on. In my own, on my own small farm there, you know, if we buy a dozen or we have 15 yearlings, short yearlings over the winter, you know, we've got colts and fillies already split out as horses start to get more mature and beat up on the other horses, they're coming out of that 30 acre field and then they're going into two acre, three acre paddocks um, so that they're not you know, run and herd on the rest of them. Um, but that's, that becomes a, a farm management decision and, and how you're going to handle your farm and your, your, your number of horses to get the right result. Hi, well, as a breeder, um, you always want your, your progeny to go to the best trainer because the best trainer will uh, bring back possibly some black type to the page. And I've found a little... Um, uh, Nick in the in the process because if you sell to a syndicate They just want to win and they want to win money for the syndicate You as a breeder want a little black type So you want your horse to go in a let's say a stake and get a little third And When I mentioned that to the syndicate manager, he said no we go in a stake to win it or we don't go in a stake so it's, it's a very difficult thing to be a breeder and try to enhance your page the way you'd like to do it. Control factor. They have zero control in determining that. Uh, Harry, Chip had one. Well, it's not really a question, but uh, since we're talking about selling, and I've been trying to sell these horses at sale since the 60s, so um, I would just say that one thing that is so often overlooked, we're breeding this horse, and this is a race horse, and you might not get the horse sold. It was alluded to earlier that uh, you might have to keep the horse that can't get sold and race it. And so I just caution people in their business plan to somewhere include the idea that I might have to be racing a horse. And I think that's extremely critical now that we do have, as somebody said, more horses than we have buyers. So um, that's one thing I would caution people. And 
The other thing is that you should have a minimum or a reserve on your horse if you're going to go to a sale. There's no need bringing your horse to a sale and just letting it walk into a ring and giving it away. So you need to have a reserve on your horse when you, when you come to the sale and know what you can live with or not live with. But you shouldn't bring a horse that you're just trying to give away. And uh, the other comment that I would make is that with these small operations, some of these horses that come off these small operations are really herd bound. And that creates a real issue when they get to the sales ground. So if you have a small operation and your horses are, every time one walks out the stall, the other one gets to go out as well, you need to kind of try to separate them or somehow put one out to pasture and keep one in the stall and, and break them from being so hard. So, connected to each other. Yeah, the, the uh, today's standard, one third of the horses that go through the ring is considered a successful sale, 33%. So the sales companies that come out with a 33% RNA rate are considering it to be successful today. So it's something to consider when um, you're going through the entire process. But And the nice thing about New York, I mean, you know, it, a, f a broodmare is a five-year agricultural product, a, a project. It's, it's five years. It's four or five years. So if you don't do well with one horse, the first horse, there's a good possibility you'll do well with the second, if not maybe the third. But over a four or five-year period, then you average out and see. It's just like any other agricultural commodity, whether you're growing corn or wheat or, or barley or growing horses or cattle. You know, at one point, you hope to average out. If you're not, then you need to sell. You need to sell the factory. You need to really think about, um, you know, getting a new broodmare or, or doing something. But the beauty of the program is that you know, even if you have to get less than what you expected at the sale because you can't afford to race, um, the beauty of this program is is you can still make a lot of money through your breeders' awards. You know, it's a considerable amount of money. The amount of money that we're racing for in New York, uh, and the amount of money that you can get if you've produced a sound horse. Another thing I, I just wanted to touch on is just keep in mind, we are raising athletes. Our competition are, is Darley, Godolphin, um, Bourbon Lane, um, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, Windstar. Uh, Windstar. Um, you know, I mean, we're, we're running against, and when you look at these, these magnificent athletes in the paddock at Saratoga, that's another advantage that we have is right here we live in the, the mecca of, of U.S. racing, which is Saratoga Springs. So when you come to the races, please go to the paddock and look at your competition. That's what you're up against. You need to raise big, strong athletes because they got to go out and they got to beat these guys. At the, at the end of the day, it's a horse race. So uh, when, when Tracy mentioned Stone Farm, years ago when I lived in Kentucky, I, I was working at Spendthrift in Lexington on my way home. A friend of mine, I lived near Stone Farm, and if I got off at the training center early enough, I would stop by and be early enough for, for, to help them bring in the yearlings. We jumped in the back of a pickup truck, the eight of us, drove 15 minutes 15 minutes out to the corner of the yearling Philly field and then walk the Phillies and it took us a half an hour to walk them in. So how big is that field? And that essentially is yeah, stuck in my mind is how, what you're up against and, and you know, what, how, how to raise a good horse. I mean, Stone Farm, you can't argue with his success, you know, Arthur Hancock. But... Um, so essentially, we're raising athletes. That's what we're raising, and, and you got to do everything you can to raise a big, powerful horse. 